The Empire of Blefuscu is an island situated in the north-northeast side of Lilliput, from whence it is parted only by a channel of 800 yards wide. I had not yet seen it, and upon the notice of an intended invasion, I avoided appearing on that side of the coast for fear of being discovered by some of the enemy's ships, who had received no intelligence of me, all intercourse between the two empires having been strictly forbidden during the war, upon pain of death and an embargo laid by our emperor upon all vessels whatsoever. I communicated to his majesty a project I had formed of seizing the enemy's whole fleet, which, as our scouts assured us, lay at anchor in the harbor ready to sail with the first fair wind. I consulted with the most experienced seamen upon the depth of the channel, which they had often plumbed, who told me that in the middle at high water it was 70 glumgluffs deep, which is about 6 foot of European measure, and the rest of it 50 glumgluffs at most. I walked to the northeast coast over against Blefuscu, where, lying down behind a hillock, I took out my small pocket perspective glass and viewed the enemy's fleet at anchor, consisting of about 50 men of war and a great number of transports. I then came back to my house and gave order, for which I had a warrant, for a great quantity of the strongest cable and bars of iron. The cable was about as thick as a pack thread, and the bars of the length and size of a knitting needle. I trebled the cable to make it stronger, and for the same reason I twisted three of the iron bars together, bending the extremities into a hook. Having thus fixed fifty hooks into as many cables, I went back to the northeast coast, and putting off my coat, shoes, stockings, walked into the sea in my leathern jerkin about half an hour before high water. I waded with what haste I could and swam in the middle about thirty yards until I felt ground. I arrived at the fleet in less than half an hour. The enemy was so frighted when they saw me that they leaped out of their ships and swam to shore where there could not be fewer than 30,000 souls. I then took my tackling and fastening a hook to the hole at each prow of each, I tied all the cords together at the end. While I was thus employed, the enemy discharged several thousand arrows, many of which stuck in my hands and face, and besides the excessive smart, gave me much disturbance in my work. My greatest apprehension was for my eyes, which I should have infallibly lost if I had not suddenly thought of an expedient. I kept among other little necessaries a pair of spectacles in my private pocket, which, as I observed before, had escaped the Emperor's searches. These I took out and fastened as strongly as I could upon my nose, and thus armed went on boldly with my work in spite of the enemy's arrows, many of which struck against the glasses of my spectacles, but without any other effect, further than a little to discompose them. I had now fastened all the hooks, and taking the knot in my hand, began to pull, but not a ship would stir, for they were all too fast held by the anchors, so that the boldest part of my enterprise remained. I therefore let go the cord, and leaving the hooks fixed to the ships, I resolutely cut with my knife the cables that fastened the anchors, receiving above 2,000 shots in my face and hands. Then I took up the knotted end of the cables to which my hooks were tied, and with great ease drew 50 of the enemy's largest men of war after me. The Blefuscudians, who had not the least imagination of what I intended, were at first confounded with astonishment. They had seen me cut the cables and thought my design was only to let the ships run adrift or fall foul of each other, but when they perceived the whole fleet moving in order and saw me pulling at the end, they set up such a scream of grief and despair that it was almost impossible to describe or conceive. When I had got out of danger, I stopped a while to pick out the arrows that stuck in my hands and face and rubbed on some of the same ointment that was given me at my first arrival, as I had formerly mentioned. 
I then took off my spectacles, and waiting about an hour until the tide was a little fallen, I waded through the middle with my cargo, and arrived safe at the royal port at Lilliput. The emperor and his whole court stood on the shore, expecting the issue of this great adventure. They saw the ships move forward in a large half-moon, but could not discern me, who was up to my breast in water. When I advanced to the middle of the channel, they were yet more in pain, because I was under water to my neck. The Emperor concluded me to be drowned, and that the enemy's fleet was approaching in a hostile manner. But he was soon eased of his fears, for, the channel growing shallower every step I made, I came a short time within hearing, and holding up the end of the cable by which the fleet was fastened, I cried in a loud voice, LONG LIVE THE MOST PUISSANT EMPEROR OF LILLIPUT! This great prince received me at my landing with all possible encomiums, and created me a Nardak upon the spot, which is the highest title of honor among them. His majesty desired I would take some other opportunity of bringing all the rest of his enemy's ships into his ports. And so unmeasurable is the ambition of princes that he seemed to think of nothing less than reducing the whole empire of Blefuscu into a province and governing it by a viceroy of destroying the big Endian exiles, and compelling that people to break the smaller end of their eggs, by which he would remain sole monarch of the whole world. But I endeavored to divert him from this design by many arguments drawn from the topics of policy as well as justice, and I plainly protested that I would never be an instrument of bringing a free and brave people into slavery. And when the matter was debated in council, the wisest part of the ministry were of my opinion. This open, bold declaration of mine was so opposite to the schemes and politics of his imperial majesty that he could never forgive me. He mentioned it to me in a very artful manner at council, where I was told that some of the wisest appeared, at least by their silence, to be of my opinion, but others, who were my secret enemies, could not forbear some expressions, which by a side wind reflected on me. And from this time began an intrigue between his majesty and a junto of ministers maliciously bent against me, which broke out in less than two months and had like to have ended in my utter destruction. Of so little weight are the greatest services to princes when put into the balance with a refusal to gratify their passions. About three weeks after this exploit, there arrived a solemn embassy from Blefuscu with humble offers of peace which was soon concluded upon conditions very advantageous to our emperor, wherewith I shall not trouble the reader. There were six ambassadors, with a train of about five hundred persons, and their entry was very magnificent, suitable to the grandeur of their master, and the importance of their business. When the treaty was finished, wherein I did them several good offices by the credit I now had, or at least appeared to have at court, their excellencies, who were privately told how much I had been their friend, made me a visit in form. They began with many compliments upon my valor and generosity, invited me to that kingdom in the emperor their master's name, and desired me to show them some proofs of my prodigious strength, of which they had heard so many wonders, wherein I readily obliged them, but shall not interrupt the reader with the particulars. When I had for some time entertained their excellencies to their infinite satisfaction and surprise, I desired they would do me the honor to present my most humble respects to the emperor their master, the renown of whose virtues had so justly filled the whole world with admiration, and whose royal person I resolved to attend before I returned to my own country. Accordingly, the next time I had the honor to see our emperor, I desired his general license to wait on the Blefuscudian monarch, which he was pleased to grant me, as I could plainly perceive, in a very cold manner, but could not guess the reason till I had a whisper from a certain person that Flimnap and Golgolom had represented my intercourse with those ambassadors as a mark of disaffection, from which I am sure my heart was wholly free. And this was the first time I began to conceive some imperfect idea of courts and ministers. It is to be observed that these ambassadors spoke to me by an interpreter, the languages of both empires differing as much from each other as any two in Europe, and each nation priding themselves upon the antiquity beauty, and energy of their own tongues, with an avowed contempt for that of their neighbor. Yet our emperor, standing upon the advantage he had got by the seizure of their fleet, obliged them to deliver their credentials and make their speech in the Lilliputian tongue. And it must be confessed that from the great intercourse of trade and commerce between both realms, 
from the continual reception of exiles, which is mutual among them, and from the custom in each empire to send their young nobility and richer gentry to the other, in order to polish themselves by seeing the world and understanding men and manners, there are few persons of distinction, or merchants, or seamen, who dwell in the maritime parts, but what can hold conversation in both tongues. As I found some weeks later, when I went to pay my respects to the Emperor of Blefuscu, which in the midst of great misfortunes through the malice of my enemies, proved a very happy adventure to me, as I shall relate in its proper place. The reader may remember that when I signed those articles upon which I recovered my liberty, there were some which I disliked upon account of their being too servile. Neither could anything but an extreme necessity have forced me to submit. But being now a Nardak, at the highest rank of that empire, such offices were looked upon as below my dignity. And the Emperor, to do him justice, never once mentioned them to me. However, it was not long before I had an opportunity of doing His Majesty, at least I then thought, a most signal service. I was alarmed at midnight with the cries of many hundred people at my door, by which being suddenly awaked, I was in some kind of terror. I heard the word BURGLUM repeated incessantly. Several of the Emperor's court, making their way through the crowd, entreated me to come immediately to the palace, where Her Imperial Majesty's apartment was on fire by the carelessness of a maid of honor who fell asleep while she was reading a romance. I got up in an instant, and orders being given to clear the way before me, and it being likewise a moonshine night, I made a shift to get to the palace without trampling on any of the people. I found they had already applied ladders to the walls of the apartment, and were well provided with buckets, but the water was at some distance. These buckets were about the size of a large thimble, and the poor people supplied me with them as fast as they could, but the flame was so violent that they did little good. I might easily have stifled it with my coat, which I unfortunately left behind me for haste, and came away only in my leathern jerkin. The case seemed wholly desperate and deplorable and this magnificent palace would have infallibly been burnt down to the ground if, by a presence of mind unusual to me, I had not suddenly thought of an expedient. I had, the evening before, drank plentifully of a most delicious wine called Glimigrim. The Blefuscudians call it Flunek, but ours is esteemed the better sort, which is very diuretic. By the luckiest chance in the world, I had not discharged myself of any part of it. The heat I had contracted by coming very near the flames, and by my laboring to quench them, made the wine begin to operate by urine, which I voided in such a quantity and applied so well to the proper places that in three minutes the fire was wholly extinguished, and the rest of that noble pile, which had cost so many ages in erecting, preserved from destruction. It was now daylight, and I returned to my home without waiting to congratulate with the Emperor. Because although I had done a very eminent piece of service, yet I could not tell how His Majesty might resent the manner by which I had performed it, for by the fundamental laws of the realm, it is capital in any person of any quality soever to make water within the precincts of the palace. But I was a little comforted by a message from His Majesty that he would give orders to the Grand Justiciary for passing my pardon in form, which, however, I could not obtain. And I was privately assured that the Empress, conceiving the greatest abhorrence of what I had done, removed to the most distant side of the court, firmly resolved that those buildings should never be repaired for her use, and, in the presence of her chief confidants, could not forbear vowing revenge.